Simon Experience. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Denise Simon Experience. I am your host, Denise Simon. Thanks for tuning in and delighted to have you along. It's been quite a week in global events. King Abdullah of, Saudi, of the Saudi Kingdom has died. Yemen has officially fallen. At least two other prisoners of Islamic State from Japan were beheaded. And the Davos Conference is well underway. We still have the nasty wars in the Middle East and the hostile, hostilities. And the contour in the Middle East is changing daily. But I got to tell you, it's my distinct pleasure to have a guest with us tonight, Kyle Orton, who has agreed to be with us all the way from the UK. Kyle has added somewhat of a detour to his career objective as Kyle has just completed his master's at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Yet, he has also assumed a track to write his dissertation on health and migration of Syrian refugees while he went to Lebanon. Having no particular ties in the Middle East, the events of the Syrian refugees and the hostilities came to his attention, where he writes often about conflicts and consequences in Syria. So, Kyle, welcome and congratulations on your successes. I appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, you know, Kyle, it's it's a it's a amazing thing that we have kind of ignored. Syria since really about 2011. Um, to set the table here and for the sake of our listeners, because I think we've all pretty much forgotten or it just didn't come up on our radar, but how is it that the civil war actually began in Syria? Can you explain it for our sake of our listeners? Sure. Um, okay, so in the Arab Spring, as people call it, um, I think it was over-optimistic to call it that, but the, the uprisings that came to the Middle East, they started in December 2010 in Tunisia and worked their way then across Egypt and Libya, and they came to Syria in March 2011, and it began as peaceful demonstrations, and there were months and months of them until there was some minor violence um, as the the people essentially started to fight back as the regime uh, shot at um, unarmed protesters. It even sent helicopter gunships and fighter jets against them. Um, but they eventually sort of started fighting back around late September in certain areas of the country. And then by December 2011, it erupted into a, an armed rebellion. Um, since then, the, the regime took deliberate steps to make sure that it would be a, a sectarian conflict because its own power base is within a very s small minority of they're called the Alawites, and it also has some Christians on its side and the Druze, who are another small esoteric sect in the south. And it, it's to shore up its own base to make sure the regime didn't crack. It needed the threat of an Islamist color to the rebellion. Uh, this has now essentially happened, and also it, it, a lot of foreigners have come into the fight, and it's been obviously the Islamic State has emerged in uh, it emerged in April 2013. What's fascinating is today, Kyle, uh, people are actually of the notion that there are no good people left in Syria. Yes. Um, and I think that's somewhat of a sad notion. Uh, there may be certainly less, um, but there was a time that there was a very large Christian population. There was a very large Jew population. Um, and so who is left in Syria? Right. Um, yeah, it's a, something you hear a lot about Syria is essentially there are no good guys. This is actually a case often made for backing the regime and saying essentially it's, it's the best we can do. Uh, there are still rebels of what I would call the moderates, which is not to say secular, but are uh, they're democratic, although they're of Islamist colorings. I mean, it would be something like Christian Democrats in Europe, uh, but maybe a bit stronger with the religion. There are also, there are nationalist brigades left because the, the rebellion still, even with uh, all of this fighting, is essentially localized. It's just, it's essentially neighborhood watch brigades. It's people who took up arms just to defend themselves and their families from the regime. Um, in the south, the moderates are still really quite strong in Dera, which is near the Jordanian border, and so some places uh, to the west of, and south of Damascus. There are some pockets of the rebels left in Aleppo, which is the big northern city and province, and in Idlib too. Though in Idlib recently, the moderates were pushed out by al-Qaeda. But there, there has been a, a great missed opportunity, and a lot of the secular military defectors who came out early in, in 
the rebellion who are in Turkey essentially and we did nothing to help them or support them and they're now sitting in Turkey uh, getting fat and getting useless to the military conflict as um, Al-Qaeda, which is in Syria, is represented by a branch called Jabhat al-Nusra, and they have quite a lot of power in some of the northern areas and in some bits of the south near the Lebanese border. And then obviously the Islamic State has now taken over the entire east of the country, which uh, it has to be said, though they, if you look at it on a map, it looks like an impressive geographic space. There's actually nobody living there. It's mostly deserts. But it, in the north and the east of the country, the Islamic State now has a lot of power. And in the south and west, the regime has most of that corridor, the western corridor of the country, which is where the population is. What side, um, the Assad uh, clan is actually Alawite. Uh, yes. For the sake of our listeners, what side are the Alawites on? They are in the Iranian camp, essentially. Did you mean the, Iranian, the Alawite population? Yes. Yes, they are with the regime. Um, the regime has basically trapped them. They were, they've been used in these sectarian paramilitary forces by the regime to repress the early demonstrations. And as I, the regime took steps to make sure this was coloured with sectarianism, and that was one of the ways it did. It was by sending essentially civilian militias with knives and guns to to massacre Sunni civilians. Mm -hmm. And so now the Alawites know that their fortunes are with the regime essentially, or at least they're made to fear that it is. If the regime falls, they'll suffer terribly. What about the Druze? It's a very interesting uh, question because they're in they're in the south east of the country around a city called Sueda, and they're essentially in the countryside of the south. They are more or less the majority uh, population in that area, and as in the city of Sueda, that's their one city essentially. Um, they are more or less with the regime now but when it looked worse for the regime they were much less on their side i mean the druze essentially side with the powers that be in israel they're very firm fervent zionists they're very loyal to the state uh, in lebanon they side with whoever happens to be in power at the time in syria they've been more or less with assad um that's how they survive as a small esoteric mm -hmm. sect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you describe, um, because of your uh, dissertation, can you describe the refugee camps both in Turkey and in Jordan? I can't. Uh, in Jordan, they have the Zatari camp, it's called, which is the big camp on the border. And that has, I think it's now... It's several tens of thousands of people. Mm. I forget the exact number. But it's, it's now the third largest city in Jordan. Um, it, it's just this incredible flow of humanity into Jordan. And obviously there are then many people who aren't officially in the refugee camps that aren't registered, and they wander in the cities and they find the jobs they can. Um, in Turkey at this point, the camps are in the uh, southeast of the country. Mm. But... But there are Syrians in basically every city in Turkey. I mean, Istanbul, which is in the far west of the country, is swimming with Syrian refugees. What are the conditions there? Poor, very poor. Um, they have been, in fairness to Turkey, which has uh, been a, a bad actor in a lot of ways, it, they have treated the refugees really quite well. They've given them a lot of care and a lot of security. Jordan has done better, though recently it shut its border and then shut off the free health care to the refugees. In Lebanon it's not very good at all, which is where I was. They have they have some camps, but they're not really official camps, and they're, they're squalid, to be honest. Um, when they have... Uh, the, there are some efforts afoot to give the refugees essentially money to buy private housing so they can buy a room in somebody's house in Beirut or in uh, in Sidon but it's not it's not working very well and it's very underfunded um <laughs> what what are the children in the education and and the you know the infrastructure i mean it it I, it, it's just horrible that I've seen. Um, can you elaborate? Because, I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine what the children of these refugees are doing you know, after so many years, and, and it looks like they're going to stay there for years. Is that right? 
Yes, I would say so. I can't see how they can go back um, now. They would have to be. I mean, uh, in in my view, you would have to remove the regime first and then start rebuilding. But that's a that's an extremely long term project. Uh, as for the children. The, the education is uh, varied. In Turkey, they have started to do educational programs, both the NGOs in the camps, and also Turkey has allowed some of the refugees to go to schools in Turkey. My understanding is that that's not happening in Jordan, and it's not happening in Lebanon. Uh, so essentially the children are, I mean, they're th- now four years out of school. Um, um, so... What is left then in Syria? I mean, do we just have very empty pockets uh, in towns that have just been essentially bombed out? Yes, uh, yes, sadly. There are the there are some people coming back to some of the towns that have been uh, conquered by the regime, and it is different And in the sense that, like Suweda, which I mentioned, the, the Druze town in the south uh, southeast, that hasn't been touched because the Druze haven't risen openly against the regime, and the city the Kurds have, the, the main Kurdish city in the north, which is called Gamishli, hasn't been touched really because it's, though that's changing yesterday and the day before, but cities like Homs um, have just been bombed out. Mm-hmm. Aleppo has been virtually destroyed. Uh, Damascus, parts of it, it, that's obviously still the main center of power for the regime, so it's it's kept more of its population. Also, a lot of the cities have swelled, the ones that are left, the ones that haven't been, been devastated, people have moved into the cities. But yeah, it's it's very grim, and a lot of the small townships, like there's a place called Rastan in in the Homs province, which is near the Lebanese border, that's that got cleared out, for instance. And there's just there's nobody left except the armed armed fighters. Um, it's it's fascinating that nobody has really spoken about uh, so much the red line that both Obama and John Kerry had laid down on the use of chemical weapons, but they seem to be intermittently continue to be used. What has actually been the fallout because the red line was ignored? Uh, to be perfectly frank about it, absolutely catastrophic. Um, the That was the point uh, the in August, September 2013 when it became clear that the Obama administration wasn't going to live up to its its promise on the chemical weapons. That was when the moderates began to seriously decline because they had bet essentially on American support, and now it was quite obvious that America wasn't coming to help. And it was America it not just wasn't coming to help, but wasn't even going to live up to the promises it had made. And so the the people on the ground had to make alternate arrangements to get weapons and funds to to carry on fighting. And the people who were offering funds were extremist preachers on the Gulf um, and. Other the people inside Syria, namely the Islamic State, which manages to fund itself through various mechanisms on the ground. And, but it's also damaged the U.S. in respect of Iran now with the nuclear weapons program. Mm-hmm. It's nobody. There is nobody in the region who believes that President Obama would order airstrikes to disarm Iran if it doesn't surrender its nuclear weapons program. And Iran and Russia have pushed on in Syria because they understand that President Obama has essentially given Syria to Iran as a sphere of influence. Obama doesn't want anything to do with Syria, doesn't want any involvement, and it's it's theirs to do with as they will. What is your evidence of that, um, that that Obama has abandoned Syria? I have my thoughts, but it's always nice to hear somebody else's. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, obviously, I mean, the, the red line is itself a form of evidence in the sense that when we got the reports coming out after this, especially because obviously Israel was very alarmed by this, and it just before that had happened, we had, excuse me, just afterwards it was, we had the our first meeting with uh, Hassan Rouhani, the, the Iranian president. And obviously it turned out that negotiations have been going on for a long while behind the scenes to bring about the so-called interim deal in November 2013, the, this joint plan of action. And it was uh, quite evident that one of the, the tacit conditions on that was that America wouldn't get in Iran's way in Syria. So America wasn't going to get into a shooting war with Iran in Syria when America was trying to get Iran to... Uh, sort of come into line with its own promises on the nuclear weapons program. Uh, The other one I would say is that America is now effectively, the Assad regime 
Assad regime's air force, and Iran has taken over the Assad regime. I mean, the, the forces on the ground are entirely led by Iranian intelligence agents and Iranian military commanders. And America is bombing only the Islamic State and also some of the al-Qaeda forces, which is allowing the Assad regime to try and finish off the nationalist rebellion and the nationalist and moderate forces. So they can then say, well, look, the only people are these extremists, and it's either us, Assad, or it's ISIS. And that's another one of them. Also, the U.S. took no steps when al-Qaeda cleared some of the moderates out of Idlib province in the north. Uh, America's jets were in the air when this was happening, and nothing was done, because the United States, if it's going to give up, as I think, if it's given Syria to Iran, it can't be supporting a, a force that can really challenge both the jihadists and Assad inside Syria. And that's why I think that al-Qaeda was allowed to just get rid of the nationalists. I think they're an annoyance to President Obama. Once they're gone, he can say, well, look, I've got a side with Assad and Iran to, to counter the jihadis. It's. I, I agree with you. It's kind of we don't have the absolute um, sort of smoking gun at this point. The, the New York Times today. I don't know if you I saw. Thought, I read it. Yes, did have a piece saying essentially, uh, you know, look, it's just it's the realistic thing now is to side with Assad because it's all it's all just so bad on the other side. Uh, it, we're getting closer, I think, to where we will have the smoking gun. But it, I. If you're absolutely push and push, I suppose you could say it's it's speculation of some kind. But mm -hmm. I think the evidence I think the evidence is very very convincing at this stage. Yeah, the New York Times piece uh, really just stated the obvious, and it was almost a breath of fresh air for someone to just say it. Um, yes. That there is no plan. That you know we think. Islamic State is taking over territory, but really Iran is taking over territory, um, and it's actually being handed to them. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> now, well, I was going to say, one of the amazing things is, you remember the um, the furore over the, the so-called Khorasan group, which is, oh, yes. which is Al-Qaeda's external operations wing in Syria. Now, the United States has launched airstrikes against the Khorasan group, and I'm, I'm not necessarily against it, but uh, Iran has moved tens of thousands of Shiite jihadists from Iraq, and in fact from all around the world, from Afghanistan to the Ivory Coast into Syria. And these people are part of its global terrorist network. I mean, some of them, like there's a group called the Al Haq, and and it has members who were involved with the a terrorist cell that tried to bomb the Saudi ambassador in uh, Washington, D.C. Now, these people have got tens of thousands of operatives in Syria, and they apparently don't warrant a single airstrike. In fact, we're basically on their side. And it's, it's, a, very, it's a very disturbing uh, state of affairs. There just seems to be no... As I say, you could, could say there was no idea, and maybe that's right, or as I think, Obama's essentially uh, strategically aligning with Iran, but it comes to much the same thing in that the United States is effectively on Iran's side at this stage, especially in Syria, but also in Iraq and Afghanistan and now Yemen by the looks of it. So where is the UK leadership in this whole equation? <laughs> uh, distinctly missing. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to have you say that officially. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I mean, after we, uh, the, the parliament uh, voted down the plan, it actually wasn't even a plan to have uh, strikes against Assad for the, for the massive chemical attack in August 2013. It was a plan to have, a, there would have been another vote after that to authorize uh, military force, uh, but we didn't even get that far. And, yeah, it was a, one of the most shameful moments of the of our parliament, I have to say. But, yeah, we, we're essentially nowhere in this. We have some people training the Kurdish forces in northern Iraq, but that is the extent of it. Where do you see France getting involved, especially after the uh, Paris uh, murders? It's difficult to say because France was essentially after the UK dropped out of the would-be coalition against Assad in it, after the chemical weapons attack, France actually had jets on the tarmac ready to go on August 30 that year. And then Obama threw it to the Congress and said, you know, we're not doing it now. And it made Hollande look 
very, very weak. It made him look like a, essentially a plaything that the Americans could just toy with at will. And so I don't think he's going to be stepping out to take uh, very many more risks to, to help American policy in the region. Uh, that said, he is involved, France are involved in the airstrikes in Iraq, and they are involved in giving weapons to some of the Syrian opposition factions. Uh, but my guess is it doesn't go very much further than that. Turkey, at one point, Erdogan was highly against anything and everything that Assad was doing, um, yeah. certainly leading up to 2011. It, it appears that that dynamic has changed dramatically. Would you agree? It has. It's, a, it's not a function of Erdogan being any less hostile to our side. That's also a function of the, the evident fact that America isn't going to get involved in Syria to take down the Assad regime. Erdogan got out well in front of his own security establishment and the population in Turkey, which is against intervention in the east. And he sort of said, I, I, will, I will see it through to finish off Assad. And then he was expecting American backing for this, and it never ever came. And he just he's not going to get burned by that again. Besides having uh, Islamic State cells in Syria and besides having al-Nusra in Syria, who else is really there um, that is fighting against the regime? Okay. Um, they are obviously the two of the larger uh, insurgent groups. I would distinguish them. I mean, one of the – just it's an aside, but I, I wouldn't call Nusra or ISIS um, – rebel groups among other things correct uh, the islamic state is a foreign at its core and al nusra is is foreign led as well it was initially a project of what was then the islamic state in iraq which is now uh islamic state or isis uh, but the one of the bigger groups is called Jaysh al-Islam, the Army of Islam, which is in eastern Damascus. That is one of the more extreme rebel groups, but it's led by a man who's uh, quite loyal to the Saudis, so he could be essentially controlled, but he's it's, it's not a very nice group. The other, probably the largest rebel group now is called Ara al-Sham, which means free man of the Levant, and that's a group, that's a, a hardline Salafist group group, uh, which does have its leadership anyway, has some links with uh, al-Qaeda. They're two of the big ones, but there are then um, moderate and nationalist groups, which are, one of them is called the Syrian Revolutionaries Front. Uh, that was the group that was evicted from Idlib in the north by al-Qaeda a couple of months ago, but it has a larger branch in the south, which is under a man called Bashar al-Zubi, and he's leading a group now. It's actually the SRF in the south is in with another larger coalition called the Southern, it's just called the Southern Front, and they're actually leading a quite interesting effort in both, in not just rebel control, but also in having, they're trying to have a form of civilian governance in the South, and it's working quite well by the looks of things. There are then in the North, there's a, a very good list being compiled of the moderate groups, and as I say, a lot of them are quite small, they're almost neighborhood watch type groups, but there is a larger group called uh, Harakat Hazm, which means the movement of steadfastness, and that's got about 5,000 men, and they're very good in the sense that they're military defectors, and they're also, they're, they're secularists for the most part. So they're they're still around. There are other groups. There's one called Sukhara Sham, which is in Idlib, and that's a Salafist-type group. It's sort of more Salafi nationalist than purely Salafist, but that's gone down in size. It's been very severely damaged by the Islamic State. Um, yeah, there, there, aren't, there aren't many big groups left at this point. Early on, we were um, hopeful for the Free Syrian Army. And yes. and um, that has fractured, uh, to say the least. Is that a viable um, rebel army today, or is it fractured beyond repair? Uh, no, that's that has gone. Um, the FSA was never really a, a rebel group. It was more, if you think of La Resistance in France during the Second World War. It was more something like that. It was a brand more than it was a mm -hmm. a organization. And the attempts we had at organization, some of them worked quite well. You may remember the Supreme Military Council, which mm -hmm. was around until uh, late 2013. That was actually – the Supreme Military Council was the immediate casualty 
I was stepping back from those strikes um, in August of 2013. I mean, this, the SMC just fell apart after that. It, nobody believed in it after after the U.S. Uh, wouldn't strike our Assad. But there, there had been some efforts, and one of the problems always was that, that, that this internal war between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which they'd funded groups of their own, mm-hmm. and rather than unite their funding and weapons streams to... to get some control over these armed battalions they they've sponsored their own people and it just pulled apart most of the chances for unity is uh cutter and saudi arabia still throwing money into their factions in syria today Yes, Qatar much less. Uh, they they are still doing it, uh, but it's it's been curtailed because Saudi Arabia essentially took the lead in. It was early. It was early 2013. They started trying, but it took them until probably early 2014 to assert any kind of control. But Qatar has been uh, sort of chastened in the Arab world with by the. The uh, Gulf Cooperation Council in other countries because it's a lot of people just got very fed up with it because it had been sponsoring the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and then it was sponsoring jihadist factions in Libya which are now at war with factions backed by Saudi Arabia and Egypt and the UAE which are there there those countries are actually uh, using fighter jets now to try and beat back some of the jihadists in areas of Libya uh, but yeah Qatar has been downgraded in its influence in the region but it is still try it is still trying to to do these things ladies and gentlemen we're speaking with kyle orton of the uk who has taken a very interested detour and track when it comes to the conflicts in syria um that are at the basis of what is going on and certainly in the middle east kyle um uh, i would ask you is it prudent or is it too late to actually move to remove Assad? I would say it was prudent. Um, it is – it's still – he is still the most toxic element of this war. I mean, it, if you want to defeat the Islamic State, you have to remove Assad first. There, there's nothing that's helping their recruitment so much as Assad being in place. And actually the perception, which is not wholly wrong, that the United States is on Assad's side. I mean, there, there could be nothing that was more helpful to the jihadists than that. Mm-hmm. We at one point heard that, uh, you know, Russia was – a very big, um, I'm, I'm guessing, a manager of helping Assad, and uh, you know they had a, a sizable footprint in uh, Latakia. Mm-hmm. Uh, where are they today? Are they um, just kind of biding their time, sitting on the sidelines? Not at all. Um, Russia, at second only to Iran, has helped Assad survive. I mean, Assad couldn't have done this without uh, both Iran and Russia. The the base in Latakia was, it, in some sense, is always a sideshow. It was more symbolic than it is um, real. But once this fight got going, Russia's intelligence agents are also all over the ground in Syria, especially with the, the signals intelligence uh, type thing. So it's uh, um, intercepting communications of the rebels and helping Assad direct his air force, for example. Also, Assad uh, is, has communication centers spying on Israel in the, the south of the country, and they're often run by Russia. One got overrun in October, so we got a, a look at some of the, the things the regime's doing. Uh, but yeah, and Russia's also helpful in some of the tactics the regime's used. So you may remember Mary Colvin, who was the a Times journalist and her compa- companion, the photojournalist Remy Oshlik, they were killed by a shell fire in Homs in mm-hmm. 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, that essentially, that's a, a Russian tactic straight out of Chechnya, is to just turn out the lights, is to make it so dangerous for journalists to, to cover this war that they can't. And that's why, I mean, the media war has been extremely important to the regime. It said from the start, we are the last line of defense against Islamists who will destroy all the minorities if we fall. And they essentially, then I say they took steps to make sure this was true, but they also messaged very strongly to convince people this was true, even when it wasn't nearly so true as it is now. And what, that, as I say, that's drawn straight from a Russian playbook with Chechnya in the 1990s. So the Chechens are still on site. 
Oh, the Chechens are in. I mean, there's been, in the last few days, uh, two Russian FSB agents who'd infiltrated ISIS uh, were executed. But the Russians are very interested in Syria because of the Chechens. I mean, they're, they're very happy about it because all the Chechens have left the Caucasus and are all now fighting for the Islamic State in Syria. Um, how long is this civil war, these hostilities, going to go? Uh, um, well, at, at the CIA at one point, I think about a year ago, said uh, 10 years. I think that's easily true. It could go – I mean, Lebanon's civil war lasted 15 years, and that's in, in tiny Lebanon where when the outside powers got together and really decided to end the war, they could. I'm not sure at this point, even if, say, Iran and Russia – decided, okay, we, we've had enough of the killing, we'll do something to, to just make a peace deal. I'm not sure that they actually could. Uh, it's it's a very, very long-term thing. Um, you've explained pretty well what uh, uh, Russia, uh, ha- what their interest is. Um, but what is Iran's? I- Iran has always wanted very weak and uh, pliable neighbors. So that's the main interest in Iraq, for instance, is to make sure that where Saddam invaded them in 1980 is to make sure Iraq is no more a threat to them. So that's there. In Syria, it's to keep open the lifeline to the Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is uh, the so-called party of God, which is the Shiites of... It leads the Shiites of Lebanon. It's, It's really the only success that the Islamic revolutions had in exporting itself. So the Lebanon, I mean, the Hezbollah essentially functions as the Mediterranean branch of the Revolutionary Guard Corps, and Iran needs to keep open the facilities to get to that. Um, Assad has also been Iran's only Arab ally, and they they obviously need some kind of allies. Um, a Sunni regime in in Damascus would be quite damaging to them because it would cut them off from Hezbollah. It's also, obviously, they want to maintain pressure on Israel. Um, and the the airstrike this weekend that killed uh, the Revolutionary Guard and some Hezbollah members in the Golan Heights, yes. it, that was evidently a, a part of an operation essentially to open up another front against Israel uh, because the, the leverage Iran has is that if they say to Israel, essentially, if you bomb the nuclear reactors and try to stop us getting nuclear weapons, we'll just unleash Hezbollah who can hit in your entire country and, you know, we can kill 500 people in a couple of hours and put 50% of your population in bunkers. Um, and that's essentially the threat they hold over Israel. So it's about both uh, geopolitical leverage. There's also ideological elements to it as well because the Hezbollah is, it, it genuinely believes that Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei is the sort of shadow of God on earth. So they want to keep that going too. There is a chatter slash rumor that uh, Iran has put some actual missile silos in Syria. Is that correct? I've seen the chatter as well. I I couldn't tell you any more than that. It wouldn't surprise me at all because they they do keep uh, sending these missiles in. Some of them are intended for Hezbollah. Some of them have been used by the regime. I mean, the Assad regime has, has fired good missiles on its own territory. Um, so it really wouldn't surprise me. And Israel sometimes hits some of these bases, but it, it's perfectly within the plausible. You're um, going to be going through an election and we are. Yes. Um, when these happen, will that change any part of uh, a power position um, when it comes to the Middle East and Syria? The British election won't um, because <laughs> of, obviously <laughs> uh, to be perfectly blunt about it, uh, the, there's obviously there are limits to what we can do and if I mean, it was Edward Miliband, the leader of the opposition, who organized the defeat of the resolution in Parliament. He's not going to back down from that decision now. I mean, he he's had some criticism that he looked weak, and he can't afford to sort of admit that, yes, that was a, a bad move. So if he wins the next election, as I think he probably will, uh, he if anything, he'll get even less involved than, than we are now. And as I say, we're not, not doing a great deal now. In the United States, it would obviously make a great difference if there was a Republican president. Among other things, it would reset things with Israel, because though relations are, uh, to put it mildly, poisonous between uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and President Obama, that's that's quite easily reversible. If, if there is a Republican comes in in January 2017, that can switch back. And obviously the 
the major one of the major side effects of this effective alliance between the U.S. and Iran in the region is that America's allies are all very, very upset, and Israel is foremost among them. So it would be a that can change. As to what anybody will do about Syria, I mean, it's, it's whether there even is a Syria in two years' time. Uh, that, that's exactly right. Are, are we... Is, are, <laughs> the moves that the United States is making today in Iraq, are they misplaced, or should we be doing a concurrent um, fight in both Syria and Iraq. It, Iraq is very difficult because the the major mistake, of course, is the withdrawal in 2011. Mm-hmm. And once you're out, it's it's quite difficult to get back in. It it was hard to argue with the logic of when the, the airstrikes began in August. The idea of intervening to stop the Islamic State moving on Kurdistan in the north, which is, uh, I mean, even for people who oppose the war, they should acknowledge that that's the greatest success of, of the invasion. Um, and so that was worth defending. And obviously the Yazidis, who, I mean, if there is any kind of international law or international moral code, you couldn't just allow them to be slaughtered and enslaved on, on the hillsides. So there was nothing to argue with in that. It was always more dangerous in the Arab areas of Iraq, though, because you had a government that was effectively an Iranian satellite by 2014. Uh, the Iranians had always exerted some influence in Baghdad. Their influence was essentially veto-wielding by 2014. And now, as we can see, the, uh, Iran's Shiite militias are fighting alongside what's left of the Iraqi National Army, and the militias, the Shiite militias, behave as bad as ISIS, uh, but against Sunni civilians. And we need Sunni moderates to defeat the Islamic State. So it's it's a very it's a very defective policy. On the other hand, it's very hard to see what else to do. Are we grooming somebody? Um, I mean, are the larger democratic uh, global leaders grooming somebody? Have they? Uh, targeted two or three people to essentially take Assad's place in the near future? I don't think so. I mean, there there were some hopes that uh, the SMC leader... Uh, Sally Madras might be such a person but it, as I say that was never realistic in the sense that the FSA didn't exist on the ground in that way and Idris was much more um, an organiser and a, a fundraiser than he was a leader the Obama administration's hope as, as far as I can piece it together has always been that essentially somebody would emerge from within Assad's world to to take over it would be it was like um in the 1990s with iraq where people would say they hope for saddamism without saddam mm-hmm. and the obama administration's hope was more or less for that in syria i think it was uh, it was tried in egypt to an extent was to more or less keep the regime in place but but to remove the, the ruler and try to sort of hive off some factions of the opposition and attach them to, to the government. It didn't work in Egypt, and it can't work in Syria for the simple reason that, at this point, uh, Assad is the regime. I mean, there's nothing else holding together these disparate... Uh, the, reg- the militias... Excuse me, the national army in Syria has broken down as well, and it, there are now militias basically on the regime side too, and the only thing keeping them all centrally focused and moving in the same direction is Assad. It if he went, it would unravel the entire regime because the Alawite generals would all think they could do the job best. Mm. Um, as I say, there's a lot of reason for us to hope that this does happen because it means that it would it would weaken the regime, it would take away uh, this sort of machinery of death that's raining so much destruction on Syria. But as I say, there's no way at this point of sort of just moving Assad aside and putting somebody else in his place. Well, there's not a very good track record. I mean, it was real important, I guess, to everybody to get rid of Mubarak and put Morsi in there. That did not work out well. Um, Although uh, now it has become a little bit of the exception when uh, the Egyptian military decided to take things into their own hands and put uh, um, a new leadership into Egypt. But, you know, it it didn't work in Iraq. Uh, It did not work in Libya. Um, so I would think that, you know, there was somebody being groomed out there or designated here in the next year or two or maybe certainly under mentorship. Um, but so it's disturbing that 
that you don't think that there is. Quite actually, I don't think there is either, but I would think that somebody out there would learn their lesson. Uh. <laughs> yes, you'd like to think so. Uh, the great problem, it seems, with the a lot of these policies is a failure to see it through. Um, I mean, in Iraq, it, it really wouldn't have cost a lot, either in monetary terms or in political terms, to keep a garrison of 15,000 or 20,000 troops there. I mean, it, it, we still have 50,000 tr troops in Germany, or rather the United States does. Mm. Um, it, it's not... It just wouldn't have cost very much. I mean, in Libya, it didn't even need that. It just needed some CIA and special forces people to help the new government to train its army and to organize itself and to try to disarm the militias. And it, it wasn't extended. I mean, there was a, a brilliant piece. Where there's a man called Eli Lake who writes for the Daily Beast, and he's done a lot of really good stuff on Libya. And one of them was, the, at one point, the Libyan government said, we really need you just send somebody, a task force, to help us organize this. And the United States said, well, look, we're not sending anybody until you can make it safe enough for them. <laughs> um, and you just thought, well, it, it's very slightly missed the point um, that they were needed to help stabilize the situation, and they just, it never came. And now it's probably too late. Yeah. Um, you know, that was to be the crown jewel for Hillary's State Department. That didn't work out well. Um yeah. It did not work out well at all. Now, the interesting yeah. thing is, uh, where is the Emirates and where is Kuwait in, in trying to keep, um, or not keep, but establish some kind of management in the Middle East? Are they, uh, of themselves, uh, just not going to get involved, or are they just doing some token operations and that's it? Um, I think... Yeah, I mean, their capacity is very limited. As far as the United Arab Emirates is certainly in the coalition bombing into Syria and Iraq against ISIS. I'm trying to think. I think Kuwait is involved as well. I'm not sure if they actually have jets, but they are financially supporting the operation, I think. Um, the UAE has... Um, been very effective in presenting itself. It's now gained for itself the name Little Sparta um, because it's been, <laughs> it's sort of contributed above and beyond. Uh, it's punched above its weight, as we would say, in in doing these things. Uh, that said, these two governments are not ideal. Um, the UAE's government has been uh, probably more repressive than usual over the last few years. Uh, the problem you see is that under the cover of uh, keeping down the Islamists, a lot of these governments tend to take that as a broad mandate to keep down all opposition. And it's been uh, the UAE's fallen into that trap. So they're not, um, they're not the most admirable allies we could have, but they're the only ones we've got at the moment. So it's, uh, it's a balancing act as ever. Are you aware of any um, UK spies, intelligence people, or United States spies slash intelligence people in Syria today? No, I, the I would I would be amazed if Britain had any, um, but the United States, as far as I understand it, there was a report a couple of months ago, which I can't. I can't remember the exact details of, but they, they essentially said that the U.S. has nobody inside Syria, and that would be understandable because obviously it's just so dangerous. I mean, people get people are getting beheaded the minute that a Westerner is spotted inside Syria. As to whether there are agents, as to whether we have people on our side working for us in Syria, you'd like to think there's somebody, um, but. No, I don't know any more than that. I don't think there is. Uh, it, it, it just seems that, you know, we are relying on whatever intelligence we can get at the Turkey border. And, and <laughs> from, a, yeah. from a media standpoint, from an intelligence standpoint, that seems to be the limitation. Um, so, you know, Assad's getting a free reign. I mean, if he, he and his wife continue to travel to Disney World, uh, it would be no surprise because he's the big winner here. Um, yes. And is uh, Iran? Yes, Iran is obviously the the major winner in this. It, I mean, they have sorry, they have more or less an empire now stretching across the the Fertile Crescent. Now, with with both Russia and Iran uh, propping up the Assad regime, is uh, is is it in the cards that Syria will be split? It, in some ways, it already is. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult to say because 
the the Sykes Pico borders, as mm-hmm. the, a lot of the people in the region call them. Um, they've withheld a lot. I mean, you look at a state like Lebanon, which um, if borders ever were more ridiculously placed, I've not seen it. Um, but that's held on through nearly well more than a century now, and it's it's kind of hard to see it unraveling. I mean, if I don't think that Syria could really be put back together, but I imagine it will probably remain officially one state. It will it will just have a, a great degree of autonomy in it. Yeah, the options for partition don't seem seem very likely to me. Among other things, I mean, it may remain a de facto partition because I say Iran. All that Iran really, really needs to maintain is uh, this southwest corridor because it can then get from Iraq uh, through to Lebanon and keep its proxies supplied. So uh, they'd be happy with that in a lot of ways, but I don't know that you, you'll get an official partition of, of Syria. So with the regime um, in kind of flux today in Saudi Arabia with the death of King Abdullah, um, would you believe that the new leadership there uh will take a different stance or will continue the same model when it comes to Syria? They'll stay the same, yeah. Uh, the Saudis have a, a very big primacy on stability um, and continuity, and they'll they'll carry on with the new guy, whoever he turns out to be, with Salman, isn't it, who got picked in the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, they'll, they'll just carry on as normal. Uh, so there won't necessarily be an upgrade in um, their participation in this, or are they just going to kind of close ranks and, and protect the kingdom? Uh, I would imagine. I mean, they will do. They're already building a fence. Uh, fence yeah, the big fence along the, the Iraqi border. Yeah, I imagine they'll just close ranks. There's not a lot more they can do. So, I mean, one of the reasons why the Saudis obviously acted out in public a lot against the Obama administration towards the end of 2013, mm. there were op- op-eds in the New York Times and they refused to see to the UN and things, but it didn't do them any good. And so they've decided to take the opposite tack, which is they'll make sure that the Obama administration can't find anything to be annoyed with them about and hope that they can leverage the the current campaign into a campaign against the regime as well as against ISIS, and there's also into a, a real training program that will actually put together an army, a Syrian army, that can take down the regime. Um, as to whether they get that, I, I somewhat doubt it. Are there any uh, essentially free Syrian army, for the lack of a better term here at this point, or the SM? I, 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 are, are there any of those lobby groups in the UK as we have them in the United States? Uh, not officially. I mean, there are some um, organized Arab groups who would be quite favorable to the FSA. I, I can't think of any of the names just off the top of my head, but so you'd have that kind of thing. But there are no – like the uh, – there's the Syrian support group in the U.S., isn't there, which is uh, on the side of the, the FSA-branded rebels. I, we don't have anything like that, I don't think. Okay. Um yeah, uh, we do, and I think that they're uh, they're in it for themselves and not for the right reasons, and that they have a very large and robust uh, and constant conduit into the National Security Council, into the White House, such that I think that um, they're just saying just let it ride, and everybody will make some money on both ends. And uh, the, I've, I mean, that's <laughs> it's further than I probably go, but I. It's been. I have to say the the exiled political opposition, which is the so-called uh, Syrian Opposition Council or Etelaf um, mm-hmm. in in Turkey, is extremely unpopular. They're, they're just regarded as essentially hotel revolutionaries. They're not trusted at all. Uh, as once the SMC has gone down, now I can't really think that the Syrian support group has anybody particularly left. I mean, they may have nominally some some fighters that they represent inside Syria, but I can't I can't really think who they could claim to represent at this point. I mean, there there is a broad sort of Syrian cause, if you will, that that they can claim to represent, and it's it. I think it's probably good to have somebody out there trying to get across the opposition's point of view. But I, they, yeah, at this point, they are they are essentially marginal to the actual fighting. Sure. 
Kyle Orton, you have been uh, very generous with your time, certainly enlightening, not necessarily happy news, but uh, uh, if for nothing else, it's reality, and, and it's a dim view of what will happen between now and, you know, two or three.